This presentation is being brought to you by SAA's Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, TSES. My name is Kerstin Arnold, and I'm the EAD team lead at TSES at the moment. My co-host today is Silke Jagosinski, ESC team lead at TSES, who will be taking note of your questions throughout the session. And we also have Adrian Turner, co-chair of TSES outreach team, along with Corey Neimer, co-chair of TSES outreach team, who will do all the supporting activities in the back end for administration around today's event. Today's session will be focusing on various scenarios of using EAD and will function as one stepping stone in TSES engagement with the community in the context of the upcoming major revision of the standard. I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First off, we will have Karen Bredenberg, co-chair of TSES, who will give a quick introduction on TSES and its work, especially with regard to our work around the revision of standards. Then we will have Ana Maria Lopez Cuadrado from the Archivo Histórico Nacional in Spain, who will be presenting the national aggregator PARES and its use of the encoded archival standards. Next, we have Jane Stevenson from JISC in the UK, representing the UK National Aggregator Archives Hub and talking about their use of EAD. And last but not least, joining us in the middle of her night, thanks very much for that again, is Christine Bella from Archive Space, who will be looking at EAD from the perspective of a creator of software. Karen, if I may ask you to take the stair, please, stage, please. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, so as you heard, we you are attending an uh, event by the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards to take the full name, so TSEAS. Uh, I say as Kirsten, good morning, good day, good evening, and welcome. Uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about the background that we have and the work we do, because we already have a recorded uh, session of that. So please use uh, the link and uh, look at that after this session. Next slide, please. Uh, we are visible online in a lot of different forums. So you have a web page for TSEIS itself on the SIA uh, homepage. Um, all the important work, I would say, besides the meetings we have and the working groups we have is found on GitHub. Um, today we are going to talk about EID and I bet you already know that the EID publication occurs on the Library of Congress webpage. So there you have both the versions that I assume we will be hearing about today. Uh, we have a mailing list also hosted by the Library of Congress, and we have the EIC webpage hosted in Berlin. And in the presentation that you can look at online, you and also we have a small tutorial, is how you can report an issue regarding if you have something you want to say about EAD besides what you will see on the next slide. Uh, Carson said uh, we are, I'm going to talk about standards revision and we will just briefly touch that for you. So all the standards that we are maintaining currently EAD and EAC CPF are in a rolling revision cycle of minor releases. That means that things will happen during the year, but it's minor things, it doesn't really affect uh, and make it a major revision. So rolling revision, we take care of the pr problems and issues you find in the report. Then every fifth year, we need to take the standards into a major revision. And as you rem might remember, EAD 3 was released in 2015, which means last year, it was five years, and we started the process of going into a revision, a major revision of EAD, following on the EIC CPF revision that is currently ongoing. And I will really look for, are really looking forward to the presentations today because they will aid us and especially Kirsten as the team lead in the work with the EAD revision. And with that, Kirsten, please take the stage and continue being the host and lead us through this session. 
thank you very much for this quick introduction, Karin. Um, I won't talk a lot more about the major revision of EAD. I just want to say that uh, while we have kicked off the revision, uh, we are essentially using this current year to get a better understanding of the lay of the land and the community. And this is also one of the reasons why we have invited the speakers of today, as well as the three speakers that we have in the second session on Friday, um, to give us a little bit of insights in terms of how EAD is currently being used and what might be the requirements, wishes, needs of the community in terms of a new version of EAD. And with this, I'll stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Anna, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ana Lopez from uh, National Archives of Spain. I'm the chief of the uh, national the Department of uh, Standardization and Coordination, and all related with the description of the document of the National Archives of Spain. And I'm going to share the. Uh, okay. Yes. Can you see the slides? Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yep. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the TSAS uh, group and team to invite me to this uh, webinar because for me it's very interesting to share our tool and our uh, improvements about uh, the standards and all the the. the the information related with the, the standards and the, the, the description, uh, the real description in our tools. So thank you, thank you very much for trusting me on the and the and this project. So let's go. Um, I'm going to 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 share a, a video and I'm going to speak about. Uh, you can see the video on the tool and I hope. Okay, um, I think that I'm, wait a moment. Okay, and the video is here. You can see the video, the video now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, the portal of Spanish archives uh, is the main platform for the dissemination of Spanish historical documentary heritage created and managed by the General Subdirectorate of the State Archive, Culture and Sport Ministry. Uh, Paris offer. Yes. Paris offers free and open access both to researchers and any citizen interested in accessing to the digitized collection of the Spanish archives. Paris 2.0 allow us to describe all type of the entities defined by NEDA, Spanish Archival Conceptual Model, and provides an efficient and effective access to information in a fast and intuitive way. Furthermore, Paris shows digitized images for, of the documentary collection preserved in the Spanish state archives. Paris 2.0 started to work in uh, 2007. In 2018, evolved to Paris 2.0. The portal was conceived as a relational database, but it has been improved thanks to the application of the Spanish conceptual model. It was created to describe records, but it has become a tool to describe all kinds of entities that are related to each other and linked to external data. Since uh, 2018, the Paris development has taken a leap now it's captured data automatically from uh, through APIs from other cultural institutions and from the different technology de developed around the semantic web. During the description of records, archivists study them as a primary source while taking into account their context. All entities that are, re are represented in the record are relevant 
and must be related to each other and other records. Thus, our record system grows by a considerable number of related entities and links between them. This enables us to create a real navigation effect, as you can see. This interconnection will increase in exponentially if we not only reuse information, but also become content providers, changing our tool into a link open data system. Pares 2.0 proves recording context or the multi-entity description function in practice. On the other hand, Pares also allow us to export our information due to, to the great work of standardization that has been carried out over the years. Pares interoperate with other archival institutions such as the European Archive Portal, through the AD, ACCPF, and AG to uh, 20, uh, 2012, uh, sorry, standards. It should be noted that already in 2002, Spanish launched the first encoded archival standard for institution with archival holdings called AG 2002. And this standard was later revised and updated by the European Archives Portal, which currently manage and support it. Focusing on our experience using AD through Paris, we can take stock of the pros and cons of these records. On the one, on the one hand, AD is a solid standard and fully consolidated in the international panorama as a standard for the exchange of archival information. Our system is prepared to explore information in AD and AD3. We mainly did the adjustment to implement the use of additional finding ends. Although we have implemented this possibility, our conceptual model is more focused on the use of documents and of document entities to describe the context, and we don't find this develop, development use, useful. Therefore, for us, the adaptation to AD3 has consisted of conversion, revision, and update of the tax. We could talk at greater length about the benefits that the use of AID has brought us, not so much about importing data as exporting information with various archival institutions. But considering the forum in which we find ourselves, I think it's more interesting to contribute ideas for improvement. We believe in AID should improve and evolve in the same way that the new technologies of anarchival theory do. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. Okay. Yes. Can you see the presentation? Okay, perfect. So, yes. So, what is our improvements for our suggestions for AD? First of all, categorize external links. Uh, we found that they take the, that the tasks that allow us to include the links, they don't let us to create enough categories to distinguish the types of external links. There is an uh, increasing tendency to use links that allow interconnectivity so that the files present increasingly more external links that so be categorized. If we categorize these links, AD will gain or we, we, we achieve uh, in semantic structure. The second idea, design on a standard way of splitting the documents. The nature of our hierarchical description means that at least in Paris 2.0, we get very, very large files. APA has solved this problem with a split between holding guides and finding guides, creating a link between the two files so that they connect seamlessly. Even so, very large files continue to be produced which sometimes make it difficult to automate the sending of information with systems such OA, OI, 
sorry, OAI PMH. There are options to make this partition, but it will be very interesting to establish an official way to do it. In our case, this improvement will be very useful because this will be this will mean be able to start to automation of our uh, automation of data transmission. On the third uh, idea, tasks which may include controlled vocabularies. Taking into account the developments proposed by the recurring context, it will be very interesting if AD allowed the definition of controlled vocabulary within the file itself. If it were possible to include tags, they will allow the control vocabulary to be pre previously defined, being able to explain inside the AD files what is an entity and what is not an entity. Que es lo así super genial de school. Eh, no es pues cero, nada tiene que ver con la educación tradicional. No son cursitos. Ah, eh, wait a moment. Aquí definitivamente vas a aprender habilidades, no solamente inglés, eh, sino un montón de habilidades. Por ejemplo, Mark, este team. Ya. The other video. <laughs> so. Okay, wait a moment. Yes, I'm the last. So, in this way, a big step will be taken to relate and generate correspondence between AD and RDF, bringing an immediately syntactic language closer to the semantic, something necessary in their record in context philosophy. So this is all. Thank you very much for attending to this uh, webinar. Uh, question as all the, the answers that you can uh, say, please, in the chat or uh, when the, 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 the course team you know, of the uh, chair of the, the, this webinar uh, say. So thank you very much, Kirsten. Thanks very much, Anna, for this presentation. I'll directly hand over to Jane. Thank you. Right. So I'm just moving things around on the screen a little so that I can there we go. Uh, okay, hi, hello everybody. My name's Jane Stevenson and I manage the UK aggregator for archive descriptions um, called the Archives Hub. So um, just very briefly to show you the Archives Hub interface, um, a little bit like uh, what Anna was talking about, very similar in terms of bringing data together and allowing people to cross search. Um, so this is what uh, ours looks a bit like. Hold on. Put something in. So, so you can see, you get the description, you get the table of contents, which you can expand and contract. Um, like Anna, we get some very, very long um, descriptions. Um, so that's just briefly, obviously you've seen these kind of things before, so I won't uh, spend too long on that. But that's what we do. Okay, so um, Archives Hub and the use of EAD. So as I said, people use the Archives Hub to find um, sources for their research. And the Archives Hub basically takes in descriptions. So, so we don't have archives, we don't have our own descriptions. We're there in order to aggregate descriptions from um, repositories all across the UK, all different types of repositories all across the UK. Um, now you can see here, just at the bottom there is something called the EAD editor, which is our own cataloging tool. So a lot of people use that and that's fine. Then we get um, very good data, um, but quite a lot of um, our contributors contribute through exports from other archival systems or increasingly um, harvesting through AI PMH. And so for us, um, EAD is, is key here in that um, the data comes in as EAD. 
uh, it, it has to be in EAD and for us EAD 2002 in order to be ingested into the archives hub. And just to emphasize this, we have 350 contributors. So it's a lot of data, a lot of different institutions contributing data from a lot of different systems, data that might have been through different systems, um, data that is of very varying quality, um, very varying in terms of its comprehensiveness and structure. And a lot of our contributors know pretty much nothing about um, archival terminology or archival theory. Um, obviously some do, but some are very small repositories with maybe a part-time archivist or, or not a qualified archivist, you know. So that's the kind of situation that we are in. So for the archives hub, um, the key thing therefore is this EAD for data in and potentially of course data out. So it's important to say that within the Archives Hub, the data is converted to JSON. So within our world, we work with JSON data. Um, so we have um, middleware called the, the SIM, um, and that uh, holds the JSON data. And so our front end and everything um, um, is built upon um, JSON data. But the data ingest, as I said, validates against uh, EAD 2002. It's normalized via our ingest pipelines. So there's um, the normalization and validation is, is a really huge part of, of our work. Um, we're very keen on being open, on providing the data, on, on creating reusable data. So all descriptions have um, XML um, there so that you can, you can grab the data. Um, and also within the SIM, which is the, the little screenshot here on the, on the right, our contributors can download what they originally uploaded or the processed normalized data. Um, so it's very much there for, for them to utilize. We converted all our data from EAD version one. I've put in about 2001. I think that's when version one happened. But anyway, around that um, time, I just came in to the archives hub in 2003 and it was still happening and it was quite a big job at the time, there was quite a lot to do, you know. Um, so that's the first thing to say. So we already had that and it was quite a difficult process. It's then important to emphasize again, as I said, we see EAD as a data exchange format. And that's key for us. Now, at the moment, I've not really been able to see a solid business case to move to EAD3. Um, I think I thought for this for this uh, presentation about um, trying to come up with some more kind of very insightful things and looking again at EAD3 and doing all sorts of things. But actually, I decided to just be honest with you and tell you what happened. And I looked at EAD3 um, and I found a few kind of issues. Uh, one of them for me was the FizDesk issue. So if I just go to the next slide. Um, so remember we're taking in data and we don't have control over that data. We can't kind of change the data. The data is in CARM or archive space or Atom or whatever. And it, it just comes to us as exported EAD. So we have this FizDesk with extent and genre form and dimensions and things like that. Those, those examples you can see at the top. And as far as I could see with the uh, FizDesk, uh, we either were gonna have to go to a FizDesk structured, which just wasn't gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. Uh, when you've got to go back to people and say, right now you've got to do this, uh, uh, just just not not feasible. Or we had to go with the under unstructured fizz desk, which meant losing all our structure. So for me, immediately that was that was a no. Another thing that might have pushed us towards it was name structure, because increasingly, um, as Anna was talking about, the entities within our descriptions are what are really important to us. But again, with name structure, uh, when we first went to EAD, right from the off, we did a bit of a hack to create name structure because it didn't have any. So there at the top, you can see, we just had to use what, what was available and create name structure. So great, EAD3 has that, but we had already created that, you know, so, so we can utilize that. Another really key thing to say, and this is absolutely crucial for me, 
is if we'd moved to EAD3, it probably would have been a year of working on converting, you know, given how we use it. And I'll come on to a few more issues with that. Um, I have to constantly think about funding and for um, my senior managers, what's important is that we do innovation, we do development, we do things that are seen to give benefit to end users. And it can be very difficult to do something where you're just moving, upgrading the standard and not a great deal else is happening. You know, so we would be doing that instead of other work that um, was gonna be more appealing um, to, to JISC really, essentially. Bearing in mind, hardly any of our contributors actually use EAD. Most of them don't really know EAD very much. Um, the EAD we work from with, as I said, is, is the exports from archival management systems. In fact, what we um, do with one or two of them is create our own export because the exports they have are rubbish. <laughs> um, and they don't have EAD3 exports at the moment anyway. Another really, really key thing for us, and it was interesting preparing this because it made me realize that EAD as a language is very important for us. So um, just to reiterate again, um, how we work, we get the descriptions in on the left there from um, in, in, in this um, um, diagram, three contributors, but uh, imagine that's 350. And um, they go through these pipelines. So you can see those pipelines made up of different parts to show different XSLT transformations that we do. And we put them together to create transformations for different contributors. Um, the variation that you get in cataloging, um, well, you probably would believe actually, but it, it, is, it is quite extraordinary. So um, it's quite a lot of work involved. And then we do that validation process. And as I said, convert it to JSON for the Elasticsearch. Um, so the XSLT processing, um, we document everything that we do. So this is just a little snippet of one of the XSL transformations. Um, this is audience internal, but obviously that, that, that there's loads of them. Um, so that's really important. And then within that work that we're doing, all this data analysis, working with individual contributors, trying to get them to understand what we need, giving the report on their data, looking at what we can do to improve their data, that whole piece of work, um, we document everything. Now I've just picked some completely random snippets here from our wiki. So the language that we work in is EAD effectively, as you can see here. Um, and that's key for us. Now, there is a lot of pages on our wiki for all of these institutions. And if we were to upgrade EAD, some of this would then become kind of redundant. It will be very difficult. I would have to think, what are we gonna do in terms of all this documentation that we've got that's based on um, EAD 2002. So that will be, that will be kind of quite a big thing for us, uh, given that, as I said, when we talk to each other, you know, it's like, oh, has it got no unit dates? You know, has it got normalized unit dates and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's the language, the day-to-day -day language. Um, that also runs through all of the guides that we give to those that are exporting. So export from, I think this is from CALM. So, um, you know, again, we'd be going back and thinking, well, have the tags changed? You know, what are we gonna have to do? We're gonna have to redo this, let, let people know, et cetera. Um, we also have an EAD template. Um, so there are a few institutions that do understand EAD and, and can use this type of template. Um, again, very much the language, you know, translating it directly into EAD to show um, what Archives Hub um, data requires. So for us, EAD enables data exchange and that's really, really important. It enables us to provide enhanced descriptions in EAD back to contributors. So we kind of enhance and improve and normalize the data. We provide EAD to, to APE, so APE harvests um, all of the descriptions. Um, it's very good with hierarchy, as we know, which is, which is important. It allows for mixed content, which is important insofar as um, archival descriptions are both 
document centric and data centric so they're quite tricky to work with and obviously as we know it does suit archival finding age finding aids and provides this well-defined language with clear rules so that's 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 good for us um however what is bad about ead is that it allows for mixed content <laughs> so um i get to the edges of my knowledge here but certainly um working with our developers um yeah they wouldn't want to work directly with the ad they work with the json and they find the json is is, is better to to work with and to pass and so forth so that's kind of okay because we have that and that that's how we work um anna was talking about some of their very large ad descriptions and um we've had that in the past and had to um up the spec of, 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 of our system really to deal with enormous um, EAD files. Um, the other things that worry me a little bit with EAD going forward is that I've, it, it seems to me that XML is increasingly more marginalized in terms of web browsers, in terms of tools, in terms of innovation, you know, and what's out there. And there seem to be fewer um, XML, XSLT professionals, when we had to recruit a few years ago, I was really worried about whether we'd get somebody that had the, the requisite knowledge and we didn't get many applicants at all. Um, we, we want to do things that don't always fit in well with the EAD schema. We're doing a names project at the moment and um, it's quite innovative and it, 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 it wouldn't work if it was necessarily based on EAD, but we're using JSON and doing our own thing. So as I said, it kind of works for us internally um, because the JSON is compact and more readable, easily easier to use for this kind of um, work. Um, oh, that's just a screenshot showing you, yes, our data is stored in, in JSON, which I don't know a great deal about, but I can, I can look at them and understand them a little bit because um, I have to use a bit the JSON um, language when talking to our developers. Um, so as I said, our development and innovation area, which is really important to us and, and really crucial for making sure that the Archives Hub remains relevant and remains funded, um, we, can, we can kind of use the, the, the uh, JSON for that uh, with doing the, the regex expressions and things like that. So that, um, that works really well. Um, this is just a screenshot to, uh, of a little bit of, of the work that we're doing at the moment to do with uh, working with names. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there, but I did note that Anna said a couple of things about what they would like to see in EAD. And so I'm just going to piggyback on her and say, um, for us, the entities are really important. So. Um, one thing now, I don't know if EAD3 allows this, so apologies, I haven't checked it, but we do have some issues with not being able to put in more than one identifier for um, a personal organisation. Um, I think we've had difficulties with how to do that in, in EAD um, because the, the entities and, and their identity, um, and, and as Anna said, things like URLs and things are, are, are becoming increasingly important. That, that's the way we look at we look at our descriptions as data with entities in them. Um, so that would be uh, an area that is particularly important for us um, as well as Anna, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I shall stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. And I'm handing over directly to Christine. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll share my screen as well. Uh, can everyone see that? Okay, um, so I'm the program manager for Archive Space, um, and it was mentioned in Jane's presentation, we may very well be one of the systems that produces rubbish EAD exports, I hope we're not, um, but so we're a system that is specifically intended um, to not just create EAD to do a whole lot of other things. 
Uh, it's a community supported open source archival information management application. And so it's intended to support like the range of archives functions. So accessioning, arrangement, description, preservation, access in a lot of different ways, uh, including through our built-in uh, public interface that's optional for people to use. Archive space, it is used by people around the world. Uh, and it's used by a very wide variety of institutions. And this is one of the things that makes it challenging in the context of EAD. Um, we have small, you know, all volunteer repositories and we also have the largest research institutions in the world. Uh, and as you would imagine, their needs and their interests are often very different. Um, we are worldwide, but certainly our heaviest concentration is, is in the United States and the user base is heavily concentrated there right now. Um, ideally, an, a user of archive space doesn't need any knowledge of EAD, doesn't need to have any knowledge of EAD at all to be able to use it. Uh, even to create EAD using it, we hope that it would be if they want to create EAD, that it would be a helpful tool for them, but they wouldn't need to be an expert in EAD unless that's something that they want. Um, we are standards-based though, definitely. Um, archive space was intended to really like take as its underlying standard, a content standard rather than a data structure standard. So DAX is what underpins archive space. Um, that's that's how we've determined sort of the the data points and and you know the the kinds of ways that information would go into archive space, with plenty of exceptions of course, but DAX is definitely the underlying standard for archive space. Um, we do have a number of different imports: um, EAD, EAC, CPF. MARC uh, is still pretty important in the United States. Uh, and then we do have um, various, you know, not standards based, um, but more archive space based CSV and spreadsheet based importers uh, that are heavily used. Uh, and then our exports include the same EAD, EAC, CPF and MARC, uh, as well as Dublin Core, MODs, and METs for digital objects. And then we do have the data exchange between archive space and other systems is greatly facilitated by OAI PMH. And we do have a very robust API as well. So um, as I said, DAX is the underlying basis of archive space, um, but its schemas are definitely informed by the needs of some of these data structure standards. Uh, you know, there's certain things that can only be captured for EAD if that exists in archive space. So there's certain things that, you know, they don't, they're not necessarily, they're not necessary for DAX, but they're necessary for EAD. So they're, they're built into archive space for that purpose. Um, our latest release, uh, and this kind of like gave me even more insight than I had before about the challenge of implementing some of these standards um, close to from scratch, um, but our latest release made support for EAC CPF significantly more robust than it was before. Uh, that involved really building out our agents module quite substantially. Um, we have, so archive space first came out in 2013. Um, so EAD3 was already in the works, but it wasn't yet out. Uh, it, was, it was growing, it was building and developing while we were building and developing, um, but we've had EAD2002 import and export functionality since the first release. And then that is occasionally updated in the year since. Um, and of note um, that our actual interfaces in archive space don't rely on EAD or EAC CPF. Um, they, um, so people that only use our interfaces, they don't actually need those, um, but there are quite a few people that either don't use those interfaces or they don't use the public interface. They have to use the staff side to actually create their data. Um, but if they wanna exchange with other systems or they don't use our discovery system, then they're likely to be relying on our EAD or EAC CPF exports. Uh, so EAD uh, three and archive space. Um, we do have an EAD three export that was a very gratefully received um, 
community contribution in 2017. Um, we solicited that and we were very glad to get that. Um, but the flip side of that is four years later, we still don't actually have an EAD3 import. Um, we haven't seen um, that there has been like a tremendous amount of demand for it, quite frankly. Um, the biggest demand that people have is not necessarily because they have a lot of EAD3s sitting around, it's because they wanna round trip their data. So if they're taking their data out as EAD3, they'd like to get it back in. Um, we still don't, as EAD3, we still don't actually have that mechanism, though it's on our roadmap as a contractor project for this year. Uh, and part of that would also be revisiting if the EAD3 export that was built initially sort of intended as a, um, this is a starter to see if that is still meeting a need or if that needs to be significantly revised as well. Um, I do recognize that, you know, we contribute to the issue of why EAD3 is maybe not more greatly adopted, certainly in the United States. Um, but as I said, we haven't seen a whole lot of outright demand. We haven't gotten a, a contribution from the community for, of a map or anything like that. So we haven't really prioritized that. We have many, many things that people want um, and kind of building out a standard like that even more than it already was has been maybe of less interest to our community uh, com as compared to some like flashier things that they might see in the interface or stabilizing some functionality that could benefit from more now that more people are using archive space more intensively. Um, and also just archives are really slow. We hear from people all the time who haven't even started any kind of systematized collection management at all. Um, so we want to still be able to support those people. Uh, and, you know, so that makes it you know, not as high of a priority as some other things might be. Um, here I state the obvious um, that, you know, EAD is problematic for systems like archive space. It's flexible because the archives community needs things to be flexible, but that also is really hard to develop around. Um, developers really don't like EAD for its flexibility. Um, and um, while EAD3 was definitely an improvement, people have been using EAD2002 for so long. They've built up these processes. James described a lot of this, of course, um, that all the things that they sort of carefully built uh, and now support their use of EAD would need to be redone. Uh, and, you know, that's been hard for people to even want to even look at making that transition. Uh, it's certainly been hard for us to consider, you know, if people aren't kind of pushing us in that direction. Um, and then um, the description that goes into archive space, it's used for so many different purposes. It's not solely or primarily an EAD authoring tool. So if we tie our system too closely to one data structure standard, that's definitely going to leave behind people that we want to be able to support. So um, I don't really have anything wonderful to say about you know what could make EAD better for us. Um, I certainly can't speak you know with as uh, you know with much in, as much intelligence as Anna and Jane have about what it could use. Um, but certainly, like <laughs> if there were some way to make it not flexible at all uh, and not have nuance at all, that would sure make it easy. Um, to build into a system like archive space, but it also wouldn't be at all practical or desirable. Um, so we definitely wouldn't suggest taking in that direction. Um, but I would advocate for whatever direction EAD goes next. Uh, and we are very much like led by our community, led by our users. We wanna support them where they wanna go. Uh, but we also sometimes need to help them a little bit in understanding how they need to help us. Um, so I'd love to see the next version of EAD really be focused on making it easier to understand, making it easier for people who aren't experts to talk about it, um, you know, just making it easier for people to make that transition 
and grasp why that transition is going to benefit them in the wrong in the long run. Um, as I mentioned, we did like substantially build out our EAC CPF support in archive space recently. Uh, and one of the things that we really struggled with was making sure that people could do valid EAC CPF if they wanted, but not have to do that to be able to work in archive space in the way that they needed to be able to do to create agent records in archive space. So I think if depending on, you know, where EAD went next, we'd love to see that sort of like balance of, you know, showing, making it so that there are tools so that people would understand sort of the minimum that they need to do, the minimum that's going to, you know, help them do this if that's a goal for them. Um, and then definitely, again, another sort of stating the obvious, um, if sort of the developers of systems, the managers of systems could be sort of a little bit more directly involved in creating the future of EAD or whatever becomes next for EAD, um, I think that would be helpful too in making sure that systems are able to adopt it relatively early on rather than you know many years later still, still kind of talking about that we're not able to do that. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Um, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you very much again to all three of our presenters. I think there was a lot of interesting um, insights in all three of the presentations. Um, just to, to check if there are any questions from the audience, either specifically to one of the presentations or in a more general sense, uh, we've got about eight minutes left um, until the end of the session. So if anyone wants to ask a question, please raise your hand um, and we'll unmute you to ask your question directly or type it in the chat um, if you prefer that. Otherwise, maybe starting us off for the discussion because that was something that essentially was mentioned in all three presentations to a certain extent. Um, and specifically with having the perspective of a software provider in, in the mix, I think that might be the most interesting question for, for this panel at the moment. So you were talking a lot about kind of the, the question with regard to what is there to do uh, when we want to update. Um, and it's not only as Jane mentioned, the technical side of things, but also documentation and everything around that. And I think that also speaks to what Christine just said at the end in terms of making it easy for non-experts to understand, which I think is even more important if we talk about changing something that has been in place for, for some time. So I think my question to you is if, if you could have one wish, um, what do you think TSES or the ES section at SAA could do to support the community in a change from one version of a standard to the next? Anyone wants to go first? That's a difficult question, Kirsten, but... Um, one thing I'm going to say, I don't know, you might think I'm sidestepping a bit, but but what's become very clear to me is that it's really important when you look at standards and developing standards to make sure that you have developers as part of the conversation. Because in the end, the way that we use EAD works pretty well, you know, in terms of our data analysis and the reports that we write and we do the XSLT and it, that all works quite well quite well, it, it, it seems to fall down very much for, for developers and, and, and they find it difficult to work with. And I know when we, when we developed our new, um, much more entity relationship based um, archives hub and, and we got in the knowledge integration to do that, they, <laughs> I think they were just a bit uh, stunned when they actually realized um, how kind of flexible and permissive and all the mixed content and everything in EAD. Um, so that would be, I think that would be important for me to bring in people that really 
understand what it means in terms of innovation, because in the end, innovation is increasingly going to be programmatic, you know, um, and so they're just really important part of the conversation. Okay. Thank you very much. Anna, Christine, any additional thoughts? Yeah, from my point of view, I'm, I'm an archivist, I'm an, uh, I'm studied history and I'm not a develop, I'm um, developed people now. And um, at the first, for me, the, the most important or the, the thing that I, 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 I think that it's important is to, to see very examples, to see people that work in, in these in this, uh, terms, no? and, and see examples and, and see how other people, other uh, communities are um, use the language, are use the AD or the AEC, and how to solve problems similar to me. Because I'm not a developer, I'm not a technique people, so I need to, to compare the XML file to the real archivist description, no? And to, to see how to, to compare, not to share all this information. So I think that um, create a great community that share the, the examples, the, the, the uses and all these things. I think that for the non-developed people, non the for the archivist people, for the historian people, for the people that work with document, but not a, a development and IT people, I think that it's very useful to, 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 to share the examples, the real example, no? And I think this, this is very interesting. Thanks very much. And actually a good point that, that I would like to, to pick up because um, TZS has been trying to get examples, real life examples in all different uh, contexts. Um, most recently the ECCPF revision. Um, so that's just kind of something that I'd like to emphasize that, that we are interested in, in having these examples from the community uh, in order to improve the standards as they are. Um, Christine, do you have any, any thoughts on, on how TZS could make your life easier <laughs> or the life of your, your contributors easier. Well, I think um, Anna and Jane's points are both really great. Um, so I certainly agree with both of those. Um, and I'll also say, I'm not sure how this could actually work, but because I think there are gonna be fewer and fewer times that people have like masses of EADs sitting around or are going to be starting EADs from scratch outside of a system. Um, somehow having people that can actually like work directly with developers to build, the, not just developers, but to build these things into the systems that people use the most. So you go directly to the system instead of like necessarily like creating a lot of example style sheets and things like that. Those are definitely valuable to the people that are doing EAD on their own and presenting it on their own. But it seems like there are gonna be fewer and fewer times that people are doing that as more and more moves to larger systems that people use. So I'd love if there were um, a way to provide assistance directly to some of these systems that are gonna to need to you know, put this into action. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I think it, it's a valid point. Um, and uh, I think that's also one thing that TSDS wants to try getting better at, so to say, and in involving the, the software uh, providers and, and the, the providers of the, the bigger systems. Um, on the other hand, we also have um, insights that there are still a lot of people around that actually hand code EAD. Um, so there, there seem, still seems to be kind of a mix of the community um, only using EAD as um, an export import in the context of collection management systems and people working with the files directly. Um, but nonetheless, a good point to pick up. Um, our time is up, unfortunately. So uh, I just want to give a quick last round of uh, applause to our presenters. Um, so thank you very much for joining us uh, in your different time zones. Um, thank you very much to the audience for joining us. Um, we will be sharing the uh, slides as well as the recording of the session um, via SAA's YouTube channel and 
the uh, TZS website that was mentioned earlier. Um, and so thanks very much. Have a good day and a good night. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll speak soon in the context of the EED revision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks. Thank you.